Hi, welcome to Go On The Run. And in this video, I want to talk about profiling your Go code. Um, so far, we've been doing a lot of stuff like, you know, how to encode data, how to read data from different types of format, how to write it out in different formats, you know, JSON, XML, how to persist it to a database and all that sort of stuff. But I want to switch gears a little bit and for the next few videos, I want to talk about profiling your Go code. Uh, this is really important. I've had a few applications that really would have benefited from me profiling my code. Um, one of them, and the one I'll be covering in this set of videos, is from the Go course that I'm about to wrap up, actually. I'm like 95% done with all the code and video, and I just need to encode it, review it, and then post it. So I hope to do it in the next three to four weeks. I'll definitely let you know where you can find it. And if you like, you can go check out that course or spread the word. But anyway, in that in the course, Golang for Tourists, I have this word count application, which I walk through several iterations of it to show how... Um, you can get sort of either better or worse performance depending on how you implement concurrency. So that is what we're going to do. And we're going to use profiling as a way to inform our decision for when and how we're going to apply concurrency, where's the bottleneck and what we can do to overcome it. So, okay. So the topic then for this very first part, this is going to be like a four or five part video um, or videos on this topic. So it's going to take us at least, you know, at two months or something to get through it. Um, every other week I post a video. So the first thing I'm going to cover in part one is the problem statement, which is to describe what we want to do in word count. So if you don't know what word count is, it's a very typical big data type of demo, like a hello word for big data. And I'll talk about that a little bit when I cover the um, problem statement. Uh, we'll talk about a generalized solution to how you might do word content. And then we'll look at two specific sort of ways you can implement that general solution, right? Which is an iterative solution. And then we'll look at since you could, and concurrency can be, and even the iterative solution could be implemented in a number of different ways. But in terms of concurrency, that op really opened up the door in terms of which part of it we can make concurrent. And so what does that mean? And so we'll talk a little bit about it. and. But again, remember what I said earlier, we're going to use profiling to inform our decision on what we should tweak. So we're not going to try and implement all possible variations. And then we'll, before we close out this um, video, we'll review the iterative solution. So that's what we're going to start with. That is going to be our baseline. And we use that to say, well, okay, this is the, we believe is the best we can get. And we're going to try and see if after profiling it and applying concurrency, if we can get better. Whatever solution we come up with after the iterative solution, it better be faster than our iterative solution, because if it's not, well, then there's no point in using it. All right. So let's talk about a problem statement. So like I said, this application that we're going to be profiling, we're going to use a word count. Now, word count is simply an application where you're going to take some input and it's text, by the way. So text input, and it could be in one or more files that somebody might provide to your application. And you want to read all the data that's provided in the input. And then since it's text, split it up into words. Now, what is a word? Word is delimited by space, right? So that's going to be either white, your white space, which is tab, space, or new line. And there are other things you can do. You can say that a word shouldn't end in a dot. For example, if you look at this problem statement, write a go line program which will print out the number of occurrences of each word. If this was our input, then we say that the word write occur once, the word a uh occur once, and so on and so on, right? And let's see which word occurred twice, of. So of occurs twice in this simple input. But look at the last word, word, dot, followed by dot. Now, if we're delimiting on just spaces alone, we will treat word that differently than if the word without a punctuation occurred anywhere else in our um, in the statement or input, right? So those are things we have to think about. What do, what do we want to do? Do we want to um, do some pre-processing before we feed it into our application, or do we want our application to not only look for word but all word boundaries with white spaces, but also do things like 
Uh, make sure that though there's no punctuation in words that would make two words that are really, one word that's really the same word appear as two different words. And so of course we're gonna start out simply and then we can always add things. There are other things that make wanna do. Things like of, in, the, are, those are noise words. Those really, you don't really wanna count the occurrence of those when you have to do word counting because they occur so frequently that it really just throws off your data anyway and they're not that important. What you really wanna do with word counting is to see the occurrence of certain type of words and believe it or not, your writing style, my writing style is different. And by looking at the occurrence of the type of words we use, we can actually tell certain things about the data that we're analyzing. Um, not only that, you can start using that for sentiment analysis. You can see which words occurs next to each word, the other words and these other things. But at least being able to show that how you can take a large input sample, split it up and count words quickly is sort of a way to demonstrate how you can parallelize tasks. So that would be a good um, exercise for us to be able to apply with Go since Go make concurrency so easily. All right, so we'll see if it actually works. So that is our problem. Now, like I said, the program read text from one or more input file, which we're gonna specify with the os.arg value of. So let's talk about the program flow. So now we know that we read an input, and it's gonna be text and we somehow get those into words and we're gonna be counting each occurrence of the word. We'll talk about detail about how we're gonna split up word. Uh, we have to worry about case also because we don't want uppercase word, uh, you know, a, a word with uppercase versus a word, the same word with lowercase to be counted as, as different words, but we, we can talk about all that. That's implementation, implementation details and we can decide whether or not that should be fixed before we feed into our program or whether our program should take care of that. Let's say in terms of just talking about a program flow now, we're just looking at almost this is architecture, high level 10,000 feet view of the architecture of our application. We'll say we have data somewhere. We don't really know or care where it's coming from. For all we care, just could come over the network. And we'll have some reader that reads from that input source, that data source. We must do this regardless of how we write our program, iteratively or not, we must be able to source that data, to get data from the data source into our application. And once we get the data, if we read them by line or it's presented to us one line at a time, again, we say we're gonna have text file, but our input reader or whether it's reading from text file or the network is somehow gonna probably feed us like lines of text. And once we have lines of text, well, we really don't not counting that. We're not looking at line content. We're looking at word content. So we wanna split those lines into words. And now once we have a set of words, now we can say, well, okay, we'll have some other piece of code that it can count those words and keep track of it somewhere and then eventually write the output. Again, how it writes the output, maybe we write output for every line and then it goes somewhere and get aggregated or maybe our word counters aggregating it and then writing the final result are things we could sort of um, figure out later. But this is gonna be the general flow and I don't think we can have too much argument about the general flow at least. In terms of our iterative design, if we accept that our, what we had just now, which is this, is the general flow, we can see that our iterative design, again, would simply be reading from the input, going through all those stages, getting to the output and writing um, your, to your word counter. And whether again, your word counter actually write it out, out to some final place where it gets aggregated later, or it's actually doing the aggregation of those different words, well, Regardless, we still have to repeat. So we keep going back, get more input, going back through the process and keep doing this until we've exhausted all of our data. So that is the approach of the iterative design. But notice it just gets some input and it sort of moves through the stages. And then once it complete counting the words somehow, then it goes back and get more input and, and repeat. So very, again, very straightforward when it comes to the iterative design. If we try, try to look at some of the possible, I want to emphasize possible concurrent design. And I said possible because everyone is going to see this differently, come up with different ways of doing things. We can say that in terms of the reading from the data, in, from data, we can have a concurrent function. Remember, all concurrent function is a function that says it's all sort of running like a little thread, nothing but parallelism. Remember, parallelism and concurrency are very different things. Um, if you haven't had to think about this before in terms of what is the difference between parallelism and concurrency, um, you know, let drop a message in a comment in the video, and then I'll point you to some resources 
and I also cover this in my Golang course. So, but there are also resources. There's a nice talk by Rob Pike on YouTube. You can look for um, concurrency is not parallelism. I think is the actual title of that talk. And then if you take my course, I sort of try to illustrate it also. So when I talk about concurrency, I'm putting a little circle above the piece of code that is going to be concurrent. Okay. So our input reading code, the code that's responsible for getting data from our source or um, getting lines or whatever from our data source, that could be running concurrently with the piece of code that's actually splitting the, the lines. And for that reason, because they're independent and we want to use concurrency, and go routine for go and go concurrency means go routine so we have to use channels so notice the difference of how this piece of code is communicating versus when we had the iterative solution so let's back up and look at the iterative solution when you talk about input going into a splitter for example you i use a straight arrow but when i'm talking about channels and concurrency i'm using a pipe or a channel layer that fat thing to show it oh i'm talking about a channel okay so now our code that's reading data is somewhere off doing this thing, trying to push lines of text into that um, pink channel there, the future or whatever color that is, channel. And then or another piece of code that is splitting lines, it's doing it concurrently also, and is just pulling lines off of that channel. And we can talk about if the channel is buffered or not, and why we might want it to be buffered versus an unbuffered channel. And so all these other things that come in when you start doing it with con in concurrent design, right? I deal with channels on core routines, but at least you get the idea that these things could be running concurrently and we just sort of feed the data through the same way, but eventually gets to the output. So now we have the basics of the different parts of our application or program flow we can make concurrent. Now we can talk about, well, which parts of it do we want to have multiple or parallelize, assuming we have multiple processors or cores in our computer? So for example, we might say, okay, since we can make the reader part of our application flow concurrent, we could spin up multiple readers, right? So if we have multiple files to read, why don't we just read several files at a time? And so assuming I had file one through a hundred, I could probably read six files if I have enough cores. Um, but then, of course, we have to profile again and test and time our application because if you have a single platter or a single hard drive, then trying to read multiple files might actually hurt you because the head for your drive have to move to this location of file one and then move back and forth, back and forth, and have to be jumping around just to su supply all those different um, go routines with data. So that might actually hurt you. But if you have multiple drive or solid state drive, then having multiple readers might be the, the way to go. And notice with multiple readers, again, this is concurrent piece of code, but notice it doesn't use channel. It's, you have multiple readers, but each reader is invoking the line splitter method itself because we're using arrows instead of a channel. And the line splitter method in itself is calling, when it's finished splitting a line, the word counter. But now you have to consider that since you have multiple instances or multiple invocation of that word counter, wherever you are accumulating your data, you probably need to guard it. If you're using a map, as an example, a map is not concurrent safe. So if you're using a map of string to int, where the string is the word and the int represents how many times the word occur, if you have multiple readers and each reader is reading a uh, file, splitting it, and then trying to update that map. If you don't guard the map, then they might, they will end up eventually updating that map incorrectly. And so you might not be aware that all your, your result is incorrect. So got to be careful with that one. Another possible design is to say, well, we might just have a single platter, one hard drive, or maybe we might profile and say, well, you know what? Reading from the hard drive is not a problem or whatever the data source is, but I'm spending a lot of time splitting um, lines. So what I really need is more line splitter. This is the splitting line is the slowest part of my application. So if I have multiple line splitters, because I have multiple cores in my computer, remember, if you only have one core, having multiple line splitter go routines running is not going to help you because it's still when you have to share one core. So what concurrency does to you in Go is give you parallelism for free if you have multiple cores. So if you have the multiple cores, then having multiple line splitters might actually help you. And then being able to just 
fit that into the same channel and have your word count to just pull words out of the channel and update its output, you may not need to do things like with a mutex because once your data goes into the channel, which Golang go take care of for you in terms of making sure there's no collision there, well, your word counter will just be simply pulling words off of the channel and updating like that map we say, for example, but maybe that's from your profile and that's not your bottleneck. Another possible design might be, since you have more cores available in your computer, you decide not only should the line splitting be done with multiple workers or go routine, but also line counting. And so each word counter, since you have multiple cores, you might decide that, oh, you know what? My word counter are not keeping up with how fast the lines can be split. So I need to have more of them. But now we still have the problem of how is that going to update the output when you have multiple counters? And you could think of it this way. Imagine that you do have multiple files to count. What if you had some friends, you employ some friends to help you count it. So each friend is given a file. You could ship a file after a friend and have them count it. Well, eventually they have to send you back their result. And when you get a result, you still have to aggregate it. So right into the output might be the place where you do have to employ a mutex or something that can sort of aggregate the result and not be a bottleneck. And that's why profiling is so important because you might think you understand the problem and where you think might be a bottleneck, but then when you write it and run it, you'll see something very different. And so we can keep going on and looking at very thing, but I broadly I figured out how if we accept that the general flow of this design that I showed before, then these are the places where we can make concurrent. And so this would be like the ultimate concurrent version where um, with parallelism, where not only is your line splitter and your reader and your word counter all not only concurrent, but in multiple copies of them or multiple instances of all of those running. And if you have enough cores, then this would possibly be like the fastest implementation you can have in terms of running parallel and having all your cores being busy, right? Because you can imagine that you're reading multiple files at the same time, you have multiple splitters going, you have multiple counters going. And then of course, no, we still have the problem of how you write your output, but you can probably write it to individual files. And then after it's all done, um, you can then post process. So with all those possibilities discussed and considered, um, now let's look at our first implementation, which is going to be the iterative solution. Before I jump in, so here I am in my go to run a directory and I'm looking at profiling and the application we're going to be profiling is WordConk, like I said. I have several examples to go through, and this is our test data, which is just some about six gigabyte file, six megabytes, sorry, not gigabytes. That would be a lot to commit to our repo, but six megabyte file, but I don't know, 10 of them or something like 10 or 12 of them. And this is a readme for the program statement, right? And it's pretty much just talk about everything we discuss with some tips. So let's get the first example and I've written them already, and if you want, the code is going to be there. You can go through it, make comments, suggestion, improve it, criticize, whatever. But I will start off by just reviewing the first implementation again, which is that iterative solution that I think is very straightforward. So let's do that. So I'll just copy this and paste this to a WordCong directory. So that way, as we go forward, we could sort of compare what changed between versions. So this implementation is very straightforward. Um, if we look at what we do, when main starts, we check and see how many arguments are provided to our program. Remember, os.arg is always going to be equals to one if we don't have pass anything else in, because the zero offset in this array is the name of the program we're running. So if it's equal to one, I note out there are no other files or no other arguments. So we simply say log error and we return. That's it, straightforward. If we have one or more arguments provided. We'll assume that those are file name. So one of the things I want to do to accumulate my data or the result is I'm going to use a map of string where the string is going to be the word and the int is going to be how many times I've seen that word. So that's where I'm, accumul I'm accumulating my results in a map. So I want to keep um, have an idea of how long it takes me to run this program. Now I could use the Unix time program to time my application. And that is a fine way to do it. 
Um, but not everybody might have time. If you're on Windows, you might not have time. I haven't checked. Um, I don't have Windows right now to check. So I figure why not? And it's so simple to do the time in and go. Before, so I don't consider checking for input or even creating the map as really time consuming. And that's not really going to make or break our program. So I'm not take time in that. I'm timing when I start doing real work. And I start doing real work when I iterate over the list of files that is provided and I have to process each file. And so the way I decide to do that is pass to this process file function the where to write the result and file name to be processed. And again, since this is the iterative solution, I'm not doing any fancy Go routine or anything. So I'm literally just getting one file name for out from this range, pass it to the file and say, hey, open that file, process it, write the result here. And then when you finish, it's good. this function is going to return and I go back and get another file name. At the end of it, notice how I defer um, the process and time took whatever, right? Now I could have um, called this any time, but the reason why I defer it here is because I want this to be the last statement output, but I do want the time that it prints to be the time when it's finished processing and it should get that result here because I do time that since the start. So it's the time that it took for me to get from here to this um, defer statement because this is not going to be executed until I finish processing all my files. And once I get this time, this is going to be evaluated how long it took and now that statement will be pushed on the uh, call stack or wherever so that oh, it gets called last. And then what I want to do is print out the results. So I print out all those words and how many times they occur. And that's why I want this to come out last because when all letters go by the screen, then last to come out is this. Notice I don't want to include printing out the result in my processing time because printing out result is something that we're not really interested. That's what we do to see our result. But for all intents and purposes, we can ignore this and not print out anything. So that's why I, I want to defer the printing out of how long it took. Okay, so let's look at that process file. Well, again, it writes the results to this map. It takes a file name and very simply, it tries to open the file. If we can't open the file, I warn and return. If you can't open the file, return because there's nothing else to do if you can open this file. So we return. And if there are multiple other files, well, then they get the opportunity to be processed. So I don't exit the program because I can't open the file. And I don't return a, a, a error either. I could have done that, but and then move the warning up into this part, but no big deal. You can choose to do that. If I can successfully open the file, of course, I have to defer or close in the file. And so, um, once I have opened the file, now I create something called new scanner and I use the buff IO package. Now there are a number of ways you can use new scanner to read a line or a word at a time. And by default, new scanner will read a line, but it also has the ability to read words. So I figured since we're interested in words, why not ask new scanner to read words? Check and see if you just read the file directly one line at a time and you split it. You call string that split, for example, to split it into words, whether or not that is faster than using the standard package. My guess is that the standard package probably doing a few clever things. That's probably going to be a little bit better than if I had to read each line and then split it, but it's something you should, you can try. It's not a whole lot of code to just replace these two line with, uh, you could still use buff IO that new reader to read a line and then split it. And then now you have words you just iterate over the words in this sense, right? Because this is what we get. Our scanner is going to allow us to have words. So we say scan a word. If I can scan a word, which means scan return is true, then I would like to get that word, whatever it is. And in this case, I make it lowercase because I don't want two words with different cases to show up as different words. And so I make it lowercase. But notice I don't do any other processing and I write it to I put it in the map and I count it. Okay. Very, very easy, very straightforward. And then after we finish processing, like I said, we get the whole line, we spend doing processing the input, and then I print out the output. That's all that is going on there. So let's run this application. Oh, and again, this is the test data. 
Uh, what is our test data? It's just really the text from Sherlock Holmes, and this is um, available online. So I made several copies of the same text so we can sort of see what's going on. I don't have to go trying to find other text, but you can play with anything you want. So let's run our application. Let's compile it. So we have the, oh, I don't want LD, but rather LS. Why do you keep typing LD? So I have LS, and then we have go build, and that should build our application main that go and that give us an executable word count so if i type word count with no input notice it says no files to process but we can start off by testing sim something simple let's try our main that go and see what happened so there we go we see that oh, some of these um things in our main application occurs once or multiple times and so on right and we can see how fast it took to process that. Um, of course, if you have things like sort, you can do sort minus R and numeric sort. And so we can see, um, well, actually let's do sort minus R, let's do uh, not reverse, but numeric sort. And we can see which things occur most often. We see um, the open and close parentheses. So that's good because it tells us that our day are matching. So that's good. We have three functions, yeah, and we do main, process, um, file, and print. And those are our three functions. And so you get the idea. And you can decide, like I said, we can decide if we want to do count things like numbers or the and all these other things. Now, this is a program, so it's not as bad, but in text, the should appear a number of times. Uh, what about our readme? We can also process our readme file, bang it, sort, minus, n. And then we see that though occurs four times, and that is what you're going to start seeing when we process text, that's um, like reading text and books and so on. So let's try another example. So from my test data, let's type Sherlock Holmes, pipe it to sort, and then let's do minus n. And so it's notice 78,000 times we got the of n to in notice the words that occur most often it's like i said the noise words we don't really care about those so we can address that in a future version to say that oh, some of these noise words we're not going to count them right we can look and see which one of these words we really don't really add any value and then take those out okay all right um let's look at the time how long did it take for us to count this well let's do that and notice it took about 200 and something millisecond. And we have to run it a few times in order to see, because depending on what your system is doing, um, the time is gonna vary a little bit. But the more often you run it, that gives you sort of the average um, time. So we can see from this, it's taking about 230 thereabout, plus or minus um, milliseconds to process one file, okay? Uh, let's see, oh, I already need that. Right, about 200 and something a milliseconds. Okay, so what about all of the input from this file? So I do star and I wait. And it takes about 3.3 seconds. Again, run it a few times to see um, where it's coming in. And so this definitely taken three seconds plus to process all of the input. So you can do ls. Um, test data and then grab it to word count minus L and so we have 15 files and how big are those files well each file is about here says six megs so the, this is our benchmark for our iterative solution we will profile this before we make any changes then we're gonna make some guesses and so on and we're going to see if we can improve this process in time and see how far we get okay um, that's it for this video um come back when we look at how to profile it if you want to get a jump on what's going on just take a look at the profile package um, documentation and essentially this is exactly what i'll be using to add profile in to our iterative solution all right take care see you bye thanks for your time have a great day